Welcome to your 2016 Year in Review Open Mind UFO Radio Show. How freaking exciting. I'm excited <laughs> anyways. I am joined by, as usual, Martin, uh, Mr. Know-It-All Willis. Wow. And I don't mean that like, uh, you know, like, oh, what a know-it-all. I mean like this guy knows his stuff, Willis. Oh, wow. I, I didn't know how yeah. to... Is that kind of like a backhanded comment uh, compliment? I'll take it, even it if depends. it is. Yeah. Yeah. No, it's not. And then, guess who else we have? We've got Lee Spiegel Yay. of the Huffington Post. Well, see, now I thought he was going to say something like Lee, who knows nothing at all, Spiegel. <laughs> <laughs> kind of like what he did last year, I think. Yeah. Lee Svengali Spiegel. Svengali, good. <laughs> the only reason I, I came up with that is I've been reading about Svengali lately, and it oh. just felt like it fit what but that's actually sort of racist of me and i feel bad about that now because uh i feel that some bengali depiction early on was kind of racist but that's for another show okay <laughs> it's nice to be here with both of you yeah it's nice to be here with you as all uh Sv- the Svengali part is just that you know they they thought he had special powers and, right. and special powers to woo women as well so yeah and I, I know that you've got a wonderful woman, and she's so wonderful that I think you sh- you must have used some sort of supernatural um, um, ability to to uh, catch that one. I, I don't know if it was supernatural. I just started reading, I think, Donald Trump's autobiography on how to attract women. <laughs> oh, um, okay. And that we're going there yeah. already, huh? <laughs> <laughs> Well, this is the year in review, but before we get into the year in review, let's do some updates. I, I want to do the update first, and then we'll get into the news. Um, the update being that uh, we we finally listed everything on the website for the UFO Congress. And, um, you know, to be honest, people, I've already told the radio listeners essentially what we've got going. Not all the final details, which they can find on the website, but mostly because uh, uh, I always give them a heads up. But what I did not tell them is that one of the reasons we hadn't solidified things is because we were hoping to incorporate Mr. Lee Spiegel, as we have the last few years. Uh, but unfortunately, for reasons beyond any of our control, uh, we won't be able to do that. And even more frightening is that uh, and, and concerning is the possibility that you might not even be able to make it this year. Right. Uh, right, and and that's that's very unfortunate for me. I'm in the middle of dealing with a little bit of a health issue that that may kind of uh, prevent me from like getting on a plane, for example. Yeah, um, and and that because of the, the the recovery process of what I'm what I'm going through, and and so I I just I did I didn't want to hang you up when you're trying to put together all the, the the speakers and events for the Congress. It wouldn't have been fair to you. And and you know how much I love the Congress and oh, yeah. the, 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 the energy of it is, is always like my favorite place to go. Um, so I will definitely miss all of you there. And I will try and be that fly on the wall as often as I can during that week. Mm-hmm. Well, definitely uh, people will probably see me uh, whilst people are speaking come from behind the stage up onto the stage with the phone in my hand. Uh, you probably, you know, with some video Skyping Lee so he can look around and then I'll <laughs> duck out. So if people are to see that happen, they'll, they'll know what that's all about. But um, what we do have going on is still really exciting and something that you kind of uh, have been involved with as well is that we are having a, a lot of 
Phoenix Light stuff. It's the 20th anniversary of the Phoenix Lights. Right. It uh, took place March 13th, 1997. Of course, this being 2017, uh, the conference will be actually a month, just a month before, uh, exactly a month before the, the official anniversary. But uh, so what we're doing is, I think you guys might agree that one of the best UFO uh, documentaries out there at all, well, a couple of the tops are from James Fox. Mm -hmm. Right. Uh, There's, you know, you know what I, I know what I saw uh, out of the blue. And he incorporated the Phoenix Lights in those and had a lot of great witnesses. And in his doing so, he was the first to get Vice Symington, who was a governor in 1997 uh, who didn't handle the events well to say i actually saw that thing too and i think it's it's from aliens essentially yeah Yeah. Mm -hmm. so uh, we're going to have james talking about that we're going to have him share some interviews he's he's footage with uh, with him and simington he's never shown before and then we'll also have him bring to the stage some of the best witnesses these are some of the witnesses who actually you know were closest to the craft as it went overhead uh so people will be able to hear their experiences and also ask them questions uh in a q and a and so that'll be really exciting i'm i'm excited for that me too very cool yeah that sounds great and then we'll have uh, a few other people, UFO experts like Richard Dolan, David Marler, and Dr. Lynn Katai, who created probably the best documentary on the Phoenix Lights itself. She'll be part of a panel uh, along with our local Phoenix MUFON uh, people who run it, uh, talking about the Phoenix Lights and its importance, uh, not just to Phoenix, but overall. So it's going to be a lot of fun. It's going to be uh, – I'm really excited about it. Well, I'm sorry I'm going to miss it. I'm going to miss all of yeah. you. But, uh, you know, uh, you're going to have a, an amazing Congress. That's all I have to say. It will be a lot of fun. And with any luck, somehow, hopefully, we'll be able to figure something out and get you there. So we'll see. But yeah. uh, but I guess let's go ahead and move into the news because I actually do have one story I want to talk about. And I'm excited to talk to this talk to you two about it. But let's see what you got, Mr. Martin. All right. Well, I want to talk uh, – this just came out today, actually, mm-hmm. and uh, it's about a Florida helicopter pilot, and he reports a oh, glowing yeah. craft. Uh, there is a mm-hmm. video on Open Minds about this, and it was posted by Roger Marsh today. Um, so a Florida witness at Orlando, who is also a helicopter pilot, reported watching and videotaping a glowing craft at about 1,500 feet altitude – that eventually flew upward and vanished. Now, uh, this, wet, this witness was outside around 524, I guess he had it right to the minute, p.m., and that was on December 18th of uh, last year, 2016, when the incident occurred. Now, I will say that um, there was an Atlas V that blasted off um, with, an Echo Star, with the Echo Star 19 satellite on the very same day, but that launch was at, uh, I believe it was 2.13 p.m., so I don't think that 5.24 p.m., uh, I think it would be too late for him to see mm-hmm. anything to do with that launch. And there's usually like a trailing plume of uh, exhaust, and there was nothing. Um, if you check out the video, this thing moves really fast also across the sky. He said that he had a feeling to look up as if he had to, and then he saw the glowing craft from the south direction to the north, Uh, And then he took out his video, um, his cell phone, that is, and shot uh, video. He also remarked that it was lower than the clouds, and he didn't really know the size of it, but was guesstimating that what it was flying at 1,500 feet, like I said. Uh, When he was filming it, he saw it go into a small cloud, and it should have flown out in like a second, but it didn't. So he Mm -hmm. thought somehow it disappeared. He stopped filming it. But he kept staring at the cloud after he stopped filming, and it finally came out, and then it uh, flew upwards and vanished. And mm-hmm. uh, there was a, another um, – Alejandro, I don't know if you remember this, but back in August, there was another similar case uh, about a cloud back, uh, like I said, in August in Las Vegas that uh, there was a story on uh, Open Minds about. So uh, he was sure that the object was not something that was known, and he has his helicopter pilot certificate – 
and he was certain that it was not like a plane or a helicopter, a uh, rocket, or a meteor, birds, balloons, blimp, etc. And the case was investigated by uh, Florida MUFON field investigator James uh, Horn, who said in his report that he thought the flight characteristics were not of conventional aircraft, and he closed it as an unknown. In addition to the uh, video, there's some stills also in that article. Yeah. Martin, Mar Martin did you see the video? Yes, I did. How does it, how does it look to you? Um, I, you know, it's it's really hard to say. I mean, the thing does move pretty fast. It, again, it's hard to tell exactly how, how high it is up in the air. But yeah. uh, that's why I don't think it has anything to do with that rocket launch at all that happened mm -hmm. on the same day. Did you see it, Lee? No. No, not at all. And I'm, I'm very curious about this. Even, yeah. even though even though it was taken on a cell phone, I mean, some some cell phones have really good camera capabilities, and I'm curious about the overall quality of it. The quality is all right. The, the object is in the distance. And, you know, I, although I often do this with videos and, and some insight for the listeners on how I look at these videos, when I start them, I'm like, oh, this is stupid. Oh, this is going to be dumb. This is going to be a bird. This is going to be a plane. So I have this rotten attitude. Guilty until proven innocent. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So I'm playing the video, and sure enough, it's this white object moving in a slow, it, well, in a steady direction, not necessarily slow. And I'm thinking, oh, that's got to be a plane. And then, no, it doesn't really have a contrail. You can't. I think there's enough of a reflection. You can tell a shape, and it's not like, you know, cylinder. And then I thought, well, it's it's probably a bird because uh, it's kind of flickering or tumbling, it almost seems. But uh, and I guess I haven't completely ruled that one out, but it's moving pretty quickly. Um and and I thought for a second, well, maybe it's a satellite. You can sometimes see satellites during the day. Uh, but it did, yet yeah, move maybe not necessarily uh, in a complete straight line. Like you said, I, I kind of lost track of it at the end. But it didn't seem to go at the end on the traje trajectory it would if it was going on a straight line. So it is somewhat mysterious. Uh, at first, I thought, how would this guy know it was at 1,500 feet? But being a pilot, he pr probably can estimate how high the clouds are. And it does mm -hmm. look like it's going through the clouds rather than above them. So it, it could be above them. So it is an interesting video, and, and, and it does give some credibility that this guy is a pilot. Um, and he was there. So, yeah, it, it's interesting. You know, I'll bet a lot of your listeners – would really like to check this out. So um, why don't one or both of you let let them and me know. Say, I haven't seen the video yet, so let us know where we can find this thing. Well, at Open Minds at TV. Oh, so, okay, great. Maybe I maybe I dozed off there for a moment. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I think you did. Um, no, because <laughs> I, 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 I like anything that looks and leaves a question behind, you know. Yeah, um, you'll have to check that, it out. Okay. And do this, do this, if you would. And and you probably would. Uh, it would be cool if you have a thought to leave a comment in the story. Oh, when you okay. look at it. Uh, okay, because I, I very often even if, leave, mm. even if it's just Alejandro and Martin are jackasses. This is lame. <laughs> no, I'm going to. I'm going. I'm, I'm saving that for something else. <laughs> you wouldn't be the first to <laughs> leave a comment like that. So. Sure. Yeah, it is an interesting video. I'm glad. And, and you know, it's fun when I when I have this crappy attitude um, because I've skipped a couple that seem obviously to be planes in the not too distant past. And uh, this one was a pleasant surprise in that, hey, this is kind of strange. Um, yeah. So, yeah, so it's a good one. Hmm. Ooh, so my story. Do I get to do my story? Yeah, sure. Do it. Go. All right. So my story is um, – uh, I posted on December 30th a response from Colonel Charles Halt, who will be speaking yeah. at the UFO Congress. Two, uh, you guys probably saw this because these pesky, you know, UK tabloids always blow everything out of proportion. And they took this uh, interview that Philip Mantle did of this guy named Steve Longaro, who was one of the who's a security policeman at uh, Bentwaters 
when uh, the UFO sighting took place in uh, late 1980. Funny enough, like, you know, the 27th and the 29th of, of December, about the same time these stories were posted. And, uh, you know, a bunch of people saw UFOs on the first night. It was just three men who saw UFOs, uh, a, a UFO on the ground that lifted up and flew away in the Rendlesham Forest, which is outside of these two bases, Bent Waters and um, Woodbridge, which were both UK um, Royal Air Force bases that were on lease to the U.S. Then some nights later, a couple nights later, Colonel Holt, who was the deputy base commander, he thought that that sighting was probably something explainable. So when he heard there was another UFO being seen, he and other men went out to the forest and uh, they saw something that to this day Holt cannot explain. You know, it's this eyeball looking kind of UFO that broke into several pieces and flew off. And then another one that was higher up in the sky that seemed to be beaming beams of light to the ground. Um including at the weapons storage area and also at their feet. So those are kind of the facts as we know it, because we've spoken to all of these other witnesses. The Daily Mail talked about, oh, this new witness comes forward, blah, blah, blah. Well, Philip Mantle, uh, he often posts stories to Open Minds TV, and he posted the full interview uh, with Steve Longaro on our website. And there are some problems with what we know about what happened. And his what he says doesn't really fit. He's talking about how he went out to the forest and he saw these lights and uh, like it was one night. And he's like, I saw Larry Warren out there and I saw uh, I think he said, you know, Peniston and, and Cabasing, Cabasing. I always get his name mixed up, but a couple of the witnesses we know. And then he saw said he saw a halt later that night. But all of those witnesses never said they were out in the forest together seeing these objects. At, on one night so that just didn't fit with the facts now i was willing to give the guy the benefit of the doubt and just say hey um i'm sure he's just got his memories mixed up you know um, maybe he did see something uh philip says he double checked with other witnesses that this guy was uh, a security policeman at the time so he knows he was there and so i felt that 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 makes it valid for us to hear what he has to say but holt was uh, a little fired up as uh martin and i'm sure lee you know him well <laughs> you know he can get a little yeah. fired up people get details wrong uh understandably so so he had some things to say and uh so we've been talking and i posted what he had to say and he essentially says you know i think he's got this mixed up first of all there were two nights the first night he wasn't out in the forest because um, as in Holt wrote in his memo and, and even the supervisor of the guy has said they only sent three people out there and he wasn't one of the three people. As for the third night, uh, Holt is the one who took the, pe the guys out in the forest and he didn't take this guy out there. And the guys he did take out there were from the Woodbridge uh, base, not from Bentwaters, which was further away which is where this guy Steve Longaro is. So he's saying he couldn't have been out that night. So I don't know that he would... Holt is saying I don't know that he was out either night. In fact, Holt goes as far as to say that this guy is friends with Larry Warren. Larry Warren is a very controversial person when it comes to this case. He was one of the first witnesses to come forward. He has some pretty odd things to say that not other witnesses are saying. And uh, Holt has not... Uh, felt him to be a credible witness and, and doesn't believe some of the things he said. Uh, so Longaro said, I like Larry Warren, and, and he was really out there. I don't know why people are so mean to him. So uh, Holt thinks maybe he's trying to, this Longaro guy is trying to help out Larry Warren in some way. But uh, of course, Larry Longaro has responded and said, I can't believe Holt is saying I wasn't there. I was there, and that's all he's saying. He did, he's not speaking to the point. But, um, I mean, it's possible the guy was there. He saw the lights over the base and, while he was on duty or, or when he was at the base. I mean, I think that's entirely possible. But the details he's, he's saying that happened, uh, which could be just his problem was with his memory. I, I just saw the fact. Well, and, and I, I just saw on an email thread this, that goes around several mm -hmm. times a week to a, a whole group of people in the UFO community, and apparently this, this guy, Longaro, 
Mm-hmm. Um, he has basically said, um, I'm very open to talking to Chuck Holt if Holt wants to get in touch with me and let's let's talk about this. So he's already put that invitation out to Chuck just to see if Chuck's interested in in in, in going over the facts. And and you know what? And this may or may not have anything to do with this, but just recently, within like the last two weeks, Peter Robbins, UFO investigator, UFO author, co-wrote a book with Larry Warren about the Rendlesham case. Um, did either of you see this this note that Peter Robbins sent to the UFO community at large? No, <laughs> I have. Well, you have, okay. You know, I mean, basically, basically what Peter, Rob, Peter Robbins has, has said, listen, folks, I'm not going to get into the details now, and I don't want to talk to anybody about the details now, but I just wanted you all to know that because of some personal issues and, and discrepancies that I have with Larry Warren, um, I'm completely distancing myself from him. The relationship with Larry Warren is over, and, wow. and I'm so sorry about – oh, yeah, I mean, he's, he put this out to basically all of us in the UFO community so that we know that he wants nothing more to do with Larry Warren. Wow. I mean, God, you, you know, my, my attitude about all of this stuff, I, I've been following – the UFO subject since 1973. Uh, and, and that was back in the time when there was still other organizations like APRO and NICAP and the Center for UFO Studies. And, and even back then, it was like one organization against the other, backstabbing, causing problems, not wanting to share information that we have because our stuff is better than yours and we want to be the ones to break it. And, and as organizations kind of bid goodbye, that whole attitude switched over the years to individuals having these attitudes. And that's what I'm seeing happening all the time. And and this is ridiculous because to me, all of these people, all of them, whether they're right or wrong, they are bringing down the credibility of of what this should all be about. And that is visitors, possible visitors to our planet, and what are we going to do about that? There's nothing else that's more important than getting at whatever the truth is that we will be allowed to know the truth because any bickering, any problems between individuals, I say ban these people from the community. We don't need people who are just arguing over crap, and that's what it is to me. Well, the one thing In about- this case – yeah, go ahead, Martin. Sorry. Oh, thank you. The one thing about Halt, though, is uh, I think he really wants to get the truth out there. And when I, I interviewed him just a few weeks ago, and he said, you know, for the most part, he lives an average everyday life. He puts this thing on the shelf, which uh, other people that were involved in the Rendlesham Force are not able to do, or most of them are not able to do. And uh, – uh, so I think that his main goal is just to, you know, he said uh, Longero was uh, uh, where he was on duty that night, for instance, it would have been two miles away from where the incident happened. And if he didn't climb over the fence, he would have had to have a ride in a car to get out that way. Um, yeah. So he just wants the facts out there. And, you know, you just what you just mentioned a second ago, um, I asked him what he thought the whole thing was. And he blatantly said, uh, this is Chuck Holt that yeah. he thinks they're extraterrestrial and he thinks they're visiting us. You know, I mean, mm-hmm. that coming from a former base uh, deputy commander, uh, to me, has a lot of weight to it. Yeah, yeah I, I, I agree. I, I, I like Chuck. I've always liked him, even, even since the very first day he and I met when he was still in the Air Force and he was stationed at the Air Force Base in uh, Oklahoma City and I was working for NBC, uh, NBC News. And um, he agreed to let me come to his home in Oklahoma and that he would he would give me, he would grant me an interview about his idea of what really took place there uh, in Great Britain. And But then he, he was very specific. He said to me, I will let you come and we will talk. Uh, but under no circumstances do I want to be filmed, and you are not to bring a film crew with you from from mm. New York. And I and I told him, well, I I'm not in charge here, but I'll do what I can. I appreciate it. And and then I went back to the folks at NBC who wanted to send me there, and their idea was, we're going to send a film crew. 
So, so don't worry about it. He'll, he'll talk to you once he sees the crew and everything will be okay. And I'm thinking, no, I don't think that's what's going to go down here. Um, and so it, it was, it was myself, um, a camera operator, a sound operator, and a producer. Mm-hmm. And we all went down to Oklahoma City, rented a car, and drove to Halt's house. That's where I met him and saw him for the first time. He was out on his front lawn watering his pl- his plants and doing – he was just mm-hmm. doing run-of-the-mill stuff around the house. And I said to the guys in the, in the car, don't anybody get out of the car except me. I'm going I'm to go over and introduce myself to him. And they agreed to that. <clears throat> and I went over and, and shook – Chuck's hand for the first time, and and he kind of looked over my shoulder and he said, "Who are those people in the car with you?" Hmm. And and I said, "Well, you know, I told them to stay in the car because I I didn't want them to come because you didn't want them to come, but it is a film crew." Oh no 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 oh no 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 they 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 they're not going to be coming into my house or on my property. Uh, I only agreed to let you come down here, and so if you want to come into the house and you and I can talk, then then we will do that. Um, but but. And if you want, you can bring the producer, the NBC News producer. He can come into the house too. But the camera and the crew, they stay in the car. Wow. And they agreed to that. And and so we're sitting in Chuck's living room. Mm-hmm. And, and and this was the first time I had had to ask him to kind of tell me what really happened at Rendlesham and Bentwaters. And he, he was very nervous. He was very resistant to wanting to talk about this back then. And... Because he was still in the Air Force, and and the the only thing he said to me when I when I finally asked him, what do you think happened? And based on your knowledge of things that we have in our technology and your gut feeling, what do you think it was that you saw? And he said, well, the only thing that I can tell you, the only way that I will explain this to you is, I don't know what it was, but it's the kind of thing that that can change human beings. And and can affect big change on our planet. Mm-hmm. And he said, and "I'm not I'm not going to say anything more about that." And <clears throat> you know, fast forward 15 years, and I was getting ready to do a phoner interview um, for probably for half. Well, it wasn't the half post. It might have been ABC News when I was at ABC. But 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 Chuck got on the phone with me. He was out of the military at this point, and and he was running his own company. And and we get on the phone, and I, and I said, Chuck, I just want to remind you, because I don't know if you remember, but 15 years ago, you almost threw me out of your house <laughs> in Oklahoma City. And he said, I did? Why? Tell me what happened. And I, I refreshed his memory about that. And I said and I said to him, but you're being a lot more straightforward now and relaxed about the story of what took place there. Why is it that you're more free or feel free more to talk about it now than you were back then? He says it's very simple. If I had told you that back then the things I'm telling you now, it would have been uh, it would have been death to to my occupation. It would have been a, a, an occupation killer. Mm-hmm. Well, you know, yeah. and I got to come down with Holt on this because this isn't I, this isn't a case I think of just mere bickering. I think that. Um, for example, when it comes to Longero, he has to familiarize himself. I think if this were me, if I were Longero and I was said, here's what I remember. This happens with me and my girlfriend all the time. You know, hey, this is what happened, you know, at, at, when we went to dinner three months ago. And she's like, no, this is what happened. And I'm like, what are you kidding? kidding i remember blah 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 and then she'll bring point by point no this happened this happened this happened to prove me wrong and i'll have to go oh yeah i guess you're right i guess i remember that incorrectly and that's what long arrow i think should be doing because it's well established record what happened when uh we just have multiple witnesses that i've interviewed you two have interviewed when it comes to john burroughs and and peniston and so we kind of ha- have an idea of what happened when. And Longero is, is not inside of that. So I think he's got to kind of think, well, maybe I have something wrong. And and uh, and I could see why Halt would be like, is it even worth my time to talk to him? But – and when it comes to the, to the um, Peter thing, Peter Robbins is a very sweet, genuine person. Mm-hmm. He's a caring person. He's a great person. And he has been a staunch supporter of Larry Warren. 
even though Larry's facts don't seem to always be straight. And some of what's happened lately is Larry Warren has made threats against people and said some really harsh things to some people who uh, had helped him and who have, have criticized him recently. And yeah. really, there's the type of things that are, are unforgivable. And, and that's probably what Peter is finally saying. I can't condone that sort of behavior. The yeah. other problem is is there's a book in Peter's book that he wrote with Larry Warren, or there's a picture. And that picture uh, has been called into question recently. And uh, it's, you know, it doesn't take an expert to look at it, even though I've heard from experts that it's completely fake. Uh, there's, a, there's a woman out there who was able to show the other pictures that were taken to compile this picture. And unfortunately, it was, uh, I'll just say this, uh, it was faked in order to commit fraud um so there's some bad stuff there and uh it's it's i feel it's about time peter separate himself i think uh it it gives him credit that he uh stuck by you know he's a loyal friend he's a very loyal friend and he's a yeah. great person and um he was in a hard spot so mm-hmm. <sighs> Ay ay ay, huh? The yeah, trials, I, tribulations. I know that's that's the, the word ay ay ay. That totally <laughs> fit, totally works. <laughs> All right, so I guess enough of that. Unless there's any other comments you guys have on that. No, we better get we better get to 2016 eventually. Yeah, right? yeah. yeah, yeah. Yeah, let's, let's do that. that. Yeah, okay. All right, so let's go ahead and get to 2016. Gentlemen, here are the rules of the game. Here's what we typically do. You know, we each brought our own list. My list is the same list I brought to Coast to Coast a week or two ago to, when I talked to George Knapp there. So some of you will know already what is on my list if you heard that interview. If not, then this will be new to you. But I'll go last. Why don't we go around – uh, our list, and we'll talk about what we think are the best stories of 2016. And let's go ahead and start with our guest, Mr. Lee Spiegel. Well, I, I, in, in the story that I was I was writing for Huffington Post, I wanted people to know that because it was such a, an intense presidential election year, probably one of the most intense in recent history. It was also the most I felt the most politically infused ufo year of all time mm-hmm. and you know and and what i what i was trying to do is i get you know, every day you can go online and you can check out newly posted images and videos showing alleged ufos but because and we all know this modern photoshopping techniques make it very difficult to know what's real and what's not real and so what i did was i chose just just a few um visual examples of some potential unknowns but but i mostly paid attention to what i felt were the most interesting personalities last year who gave us some really interesting ufo food for thought mhm and 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 to me um well and and of course for me it's it all started in january with what I'm calling the the Hillary Clinton John Podesta connection, yeah, <laughs> mm-hmm. you, you know, I mean, really, it kind of overshadowed any individual UFO reports or images or videos because this this was the one UFO related story that persisted all year long, and and ironically, it didn't even involve any specific UFO sighting, mm-hmm. <laughs> you know. Mm-hmm. Um, so, so for me, my my hands down winner for the top UFO story of 2016 goes to the two of them, to the the one two punch of Hillary and and Podesta. Uh, I mean, what they did during the year, I thought I thought was amazing. Mm-hmm. Um, and to give that rundown, like you said, it started in January. That's when Hillary Clinton told the Conway Daily Sun in New Hampshire, one yeah. of these guys was brave enough to ask the question about UFOs. And she said she was going to look into Area 51 and, and UFOs. Yeah. Uh, and that started it in January. Then, uh, I, I don't know, let's see, there are some more in March then she spoke with a uh, Las Vegas news program that George Knapp uh, is affiliated with. And mm-hmm. they asked uh, Podesta 
about UFOs, and he said that he has shared information with Hillary, and she says she does want to look into it. Then in March, uh, the same month, she was on Jimmy Kimmel, where he asked about UFOs, and she said, yeah, she even said they're now called UAPs. Um, This is just some of it. And then April, uh, she was on a morning show where she confirmed that, yeah, the UFOs is still on her agenda. And this is huge because in presidential campaigns, It's been brought up uh, very sparingly and in the background, you know. No, I'm 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 going to say I'm saying zero. I don't think it was has ever been brought up in this way. Well, there's the Kucinich, uh, not like this. Yeah, Yeah, there's little smidges, but not like where it was part of their campaign. No, uh, you know, I mean, sure, they had other issues that they were dealing with. And, and what, what was also ironic or kind of funny to me when during the, the presidential debates of a few years ago, when Dennis Kucinich was asked to describe the UFO he claims that he saw, it, the, the, what, what, whoever the moderator was who asked him um, specifically came to that debate ready to ask Dennis Kucinich about a UFO. And yet... In in these debates from 2016, no moderator of any debate even brought up the idea to ask Hillary Clinton, uh, we understand you're interested in UFOs. Mm. What, yeah. what, what could you tell us about that? That would have been a really interesting moment, I think. Because mm-hmm. at the very least... And I'm least, also surprised... Yeah, I, was, I was going to say, I'm surprised Trump didn't bring it up. To, I, to, I, I was, was going to say yeah, the yeah. same thing. Yes. Yeah, because because I, I I even sent a note to John Podesta and to Hillary's you office. You sent a note to Trump to say, "Hey, get her on this UFO thing." <laughs> <laughs> well, well, I mean, I, and and nobody responded to me. But my 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 well, my point was, I wanted one of the moderators of a debate to at least bring the the subject up to ask mm-hmm. Hillary why she has gone around talking about UFOs and why she has made promises to those American registered voters that if they vote for her and, and give her the presidency, she will do whatever she can to, to come out with, you know, formally classified documents. Because then, then what would happen there in the debate environment then – the the moderator would then have to turn to Donald Trump and say, "Mr. Trump, do you want to respond to that?" And that's what I wanted to hear. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. None of that. None of that happened. Now I try to ignore the conspiracy stuff out there these days. The real wild, goofy stuff. I don't have time, and it just well, it, yeah. it pisses me off to be frank. <laughs> and uh, I don't know. <laughs> yeah. I think Martin, you and I were talking about this. I'm surprisingly, I have not seen anybody say yet. Um, and I have a couple of people that I thought would pull this one out, but uh, I haven't heard anybody say she probably lost because of that. No, that that you know they did, the people in charge of UFOs didn't want anybody to know, so they made sure she lost. <laughs> have you guys heard that at no, all? No, no, I, no. I ha- I haven't, and I wouldn't believe that if somebody tried to convince oh. me of that. Neither yeah. would I, but I'm just surprised that nobody's uh, pulled that one out. Well, I but think I, this and, is. And, and, I, yeah, go ahead. Pardon me. I just think this is a time that is definitely different than uh, than previous. You know, I mean, previously, um, Kucinich just you know took a nosedive during that. Uh, right after he, I don't know if it had everything to do with that or not, but I, I just think it's the first time the topic hasn't been so taboo. Yeah. During a yeah. campaign, it, it's shocking. I mean, what, what, when I was putting my story together, and I and I mentioned to my editor that 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 I felt it was really important to to make Hillary Clinton and John Podesta as the number one part of my story, uh, my editor said to me, "Well, you know what? It's like it's old news because Bill Bill Clinton has already said that he he tried to find out about UFO information." And I said, "No. Here's the difference about this." What Bill Clinton did, he didn't start looking into UFOs until his second term of office. He was mm-hmm. already pre- already president for four years. And it was after he was reelected, that's when he, he asked his staff to go look, about, look for information about Roswell and Area 51. And that's what he did. The difference is what his wife did throughout 2016, she made it a, a policy point of trying to get people to elect her. It was, it mm-hmm. was, she was basically saying to people, I, I believe that 
UFOs are some kind of an issue. People want to know about it. I'd like to know about it. And so if you elect me to president, I will do what I can. Now, we mm-hmm. none of us know if, if she ever would have fulfilled that. But that's the difference between what she was planning on doing even be sure, before she became president. Why didn't, why didn't her husband do something about it immediately when he became president? But he didn't. And he so didn't really he, he talk came, publicly about it until after he right. was president. He was over. Yeah, exactly. You, you know, um, we may never know if if Hillary would have honored her UFO disclosure promise. But to me, it's amazing that she kept the idea alive throughout the whole campaign. Mm. I agree. You know, that was uh, maybe my I have a couple that that vie for the top spot, but that was probably my top story, too. So let's yeah. go to Martin. What's your top story? Well, um, I'm, I'm going to take a little a jag first and just Ooh. say that I think that um, if I had to describe 2016 as uh, what type of year it was uh, for sightings, um, I would say it's a triangle year. And mm. the, the reason I'd say that, and, and Lee, I know you had your 1975 encounter. That was just amazing. Right. But um, yeah. What the reason I'm saying that is, Alejandro, I went through uh, uh, open minds from uh, beginning to end of 2016, and it seemed like every other story was a triangle UFO. And so I looked online. It doesn't seem like a real high MUFON unexplainable triangle UFOs for 2016. But then I went to um, a New Fork, um, and I'll tell you what, it's at least uh, – I think somewhere around 200 last year uh, reports of triangles. So I just think, um, you know, a lot of people are trying to explain them away as uh, possible uh, uh, military craft. But uh, uh, or the Aurora, I had someone uh, write me recently about that. But it has uh, nothing to do with something floating slowly over uh, treetops making no noise, something like that. But yeah. Um, so I just want to say I think 2016 was definitely a year of uh, a lot of triangles, and I don't know uh, if it's going to continue. Uh, but uh, what I think is the most important part is really not about sightings or anything, but I think it's um, kind of the science community um, last year about possible alien life. There was a lot going on, uh, a lot of examples going on about that last year. Um, and, uh, Lee, I think you did a, one story on that, that alien civilizations may number in the trillions, a new study from authors uh, Adam Frank and uh, Woodruff Sullivan. Uh, yeah. Looking discoveries of uh, possible habitable, exo, uh, habitable exoplanets and considered the odds. Um, even if they were pessimistic, um, You'd have to search 100 billion habitable zone planets before you found a civilization. There'd still be uh, just a, lo- a lot, so, yeah. So so many, yeah. But um, mm-hmm. there was other uh, cases. I mean, other studies as well. You know, a Canadian uh, astrophysicist. Uh, they have discovered 234 cases of what they call uh, periodic uh, spectral modulations um, uh, through solar type stars, which was another kind of uh, interesting one. Um, involved with possible life out there. And along these lines, um, there was published last October in the uh, Astrophysical Journal uh, from a team of international astronomers. Um, And that was that they made a mistake. There's more like um, the universe has more like at least 2 trillion galaxies, at least 10 to 20 times of what they thought before, and only about 10% of that is visible um, from here. Mm-hmm. And uh, also, uh, along the sort of along the same lines, uh, the Russian billionaire uh, Yuri Milner, um, in 2015, he pledged $100 million, um, to do uh, some alien hunting projects. And this last year, in 2016, he said that he would spend another $100 million to create miniature spacecraft to look for extraterrestrial life in uh, the closest neighbor neighboring star system, which is uh, 25 trillion miles away only. So I, mm-hmm. I just think it's been a, a big leap last year into, like, the science community, getting into the possibility of uh, intelligent and or um, 
any kind of extraterrestrial life. Well, and and you know the the, the big buzz now with NASA is is that the nine billion dollar James Webb Space Telescope mm-hmm. when that when that's launched in 2018 next year, um, that's that's going to bring us even closer to nailing down possible planetary systems that may be habitable uh, because of how much more powerful this thing is than than Hubble telescope. Mm-hmm. Um, it's it's going to actually be able to this thing. It will be able to go so far back in time where it will be able to see remnants of the Big Bang theory. Mm-hmm. The Big Bang theory. Uh, it's not a theory. It actually happened. Um, but yeah, it, it's like a whole new territory of astronomy because we're going to be able to see things that we've never been able to see before because of how powerful this thing is and and you know the other interesting thing because i wrote a story about this um i didn't realize at first for all the years that the hubble telescope has been giving us incredible imagery um it has occasionally needed some repairs mm-hmm. and, mm-hmm. and you know we, we used to be able to send astronauts to to hubble and make the repairs so that it, it would keep working when the web telescope goes out it it's not going to be able to do that it's going to be more like in an orbit around around the sun. Uh, oh, closer, really? Cl- closer to the sun, uh, it's it's going to be it's going to be totally on its own. Which means, wow. um, if there's any any problems with it, we won't be able to fix it. <laughs> wow. So so yeah, it's really interesting how this is all coming together. You know what's funny is um, this was a big deal on my list last year, but huh? not this year. Although it probably, listening to what you have to say, Martin, I agree with you 100%, probably should be just because I think it's been more of a continuation. And it's something I'm always excited about every day because it's become this huge part of space exploration and NASA's goal is to find alien life. And that, to me, is so shocking and such a big change and it's so refreshing. And I think that because of that, because we see – more of that in the public eye, that is what's created this atmosphere that has allowed Hillary Clinton to come out and and talk more about Area 51 and UFOs and everything. And um, like I keep saying, I think that that topic is so important to the UFO field. And, And I know a lot of People in this field get frustrated. Oh, they're talking about microbes and they're just. But I think that's a big deal. When they find a microbe, there are still a lot of people who don't believe there's any alien life out there at all, not even a microbe. So when you find a microbe and change, it changes everything because it means that life is abundant out there. So uh, it makes it even more plausible that uh, there is intelligent extraterrestrial life out there so it is an exciting topic um i also like martin how you did you cheated like i do i do this <laughs> so i i appreciate you and i applaud your 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 shiftiness there um where you were able to get two stories out there you talked about the triangles yeah. and then like we hear so much about in these elections you pivoted to a completely <laughs> different topic well yeah uh I, I you guess learn I'm, from those yeah. debates. Snake oil salesman here. Yeah. Okay, so <laughs> Mar- 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 Martin, you're gonna have to miss a turn now. Oh no. <laughs> no, we'll, we'll give you your turn because I appreciate that how you did that. But uh, you're right. We've talked about this before. Lots of triangle sightings. But um, okay, my next one. I my turn. My turn. Uh, Let's go. I got a lot, but I guess the one I have to uh, definitely go to kind of piggybacks on uh, yours, Lee, in that it has to do with Podesta and his emails, uh, the WikiLeaks, because the WikiLeaks were full of UFO stories, and I think they were more significant than many are giving them credit for. For one, uh, we did, you know, you talked about Hillary. We know that uh, last year, um, in 2015, oh, now two years ago, in late 2015, when Hillary went on to Jimmy Kimmel, uh, through right. the emails, we found out they wanted Jimmy Kimmel and were expecting him to ask about UFOs then. And they were ready for it. And uh, she was going to use the term UAP. She practiced it and what it meant, yeah. uh, which is another term for UFOs used by scientific types. 
And we're going to have a speaker, Ted Rowe from NARCAP at um, the UFO oh, Congress this year. And he feels, and I think they're probably right, that he and, and his colleague, Dr. Richard Haynes, are the ones who introduced this, this term to John Podesta. Yes. That's right. When they met him, and uh, that's why he's using this term now, because uh, they're a well-respected organization. But besides that, of course, uh, and all the other UFO stuff, there was the Edgar Mitchell stuff. Uh, yeah. That was somewhat interesting. You wrote probably the best story on it, Lee, and about how you know they were trying to arrange this, this meeting with Edgar Mitchell. Uh, but I think the most exciting to me, and I've talked about this at length on the show here, is uh, Tom DeLong. That Tom right. DeLong. We all heard, you know, his uh, he he's been interviewed by George Knapp. He said some pretty wild things. He he says he's gotten information from insiders that uh, the government is back engineering uh, alien craft. And through these WikiLeaks, we find that uh, that he really was talking to insiders. What they told him, we don't know for sure. But this is a guy who's going around saying, hey, the government's telling me we're back engineering UFOs and I'm going to prove it. And that's his goal. And given that that his, is his goal, he still is in talks with John Podesta, who then arranges a meeting with him and one of the guys in charge of Area 51, one of the guys in charge of Wright Patterson Laboratories, where, uh, you know, they investigated UFOs and where Tom DeLong points out, you know, if there was a – well, he doesn't say if there was a Roswell crash. He says that's where they took the alien spacecraft from Roswell and with a guy who was the uh, second in command or at least the assistant to the commander, I should say, of, of Air Force Space Command of mm -hmm. all places, for goodness sake. So mm -hmm. this – I, to me, that's that that's amazing that these people would talk to Tom DeLong, given what he has said, and uh, wow. Yeah. Well, and and you you will be pleased to know, Alejandro. I think that uh, I made the Tom DeLong episodes my number two pick, and in Ooh, and in nice. my in, in my story, I've 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 linked my readers to your excellent piece in Open Minds. Oh, thank uh, you very much. Yeah, because because you wrote a really great piece about it. Uh, because as you know, you and I have, have talked about this. I didn't write anything about Tom DeLong during the year because just because I didn't, and one of the reasons was I I'm I'm not a fan of people who make uh, claims uh, about things or proclamations and they tease the public. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and I, there, are, there are other people in the field who I've had the same kind of problem with. And I felt that DeLong was to a, to a point teasing people saying, oh, I'm, I'm, you know, I have 10 people that I'm working with that are at the highest levels of the Department of Defense and NASA and the military. Well, OK, Tom, who are these people? What are they telling you? Don't tease us. Don't make mm -hmm. us wait. Don't make us wait like four or five years for a documentary that you might put together. Tell us now. What do you have now? Time is, is marching. Let us know what's going on now. So I stayed away from writing about him, but I was very careful to watch what was going on. And, and your piece in Open Minds was, was very well written. And I thought, well, if, I, if I'm going to write about this, I'm going to, I want to link my readers to a piece that I thought was very intelligently put together, and that was yours. Oh. Thank you. I, I know that Tom uh, is aware of my pieces, and mm -hmm. uh, from what I understand, they're on the right track. Uh, there were a lot of people making assumptions about all of that that yeah. I don't really agree with, and I, I seem to be a little off, but there, there's more information there that we don't know. Like you said, there's a tease. Was yeah. this a tease of, of just nothing? Uh, but I think what we're being teased with, at least, is is more substantive uh, than at first we thought, which may just be more frustrating, <laughs> really, when it comes down to it. Well, he's got a – his film yeah. is coming out pretty soon. His, uh, his nonfiction book, I believe, is coming out within the next – The first volume comes out in March, right. and I guess it's going to be over time. And this first one's only going to be more along ancient aliens type of stuff. So it might yeah. not even – really get into this this yeah. uh, military stuff. Now, someone like uh, Tom DeLong, someone in his position, how vulnerable do you think someone like he is to 
being fed uh, misinformation? That's a great question. And, you know, um, um, Robbie Graham of uh, Silver Screen Saucers, he's in the UK, a very academic person who investigates UFOs, and he's written a book called Silver Screen Saucers, a great thinker. And he points out, which is accurate, that there have been times where the government has put out information or teased people in the media with information and then not coming forward, kind of alluded to uh, this sort of thing. And then, of course, we have uh, what I've written at length about the Doty situation where this OSI guy released stuff like MJ-12 and other stuff, which um, is highly dubious. So it's entirely possible um, – from what I understand, Tom DeLong is aware of that, though. Uh, he's not, you know, completely ignorant of that possibility. So um, you're right. It's it's possible. Hmm. Well, you know, and I, and I don't think that it would be fair for people to say, well, Tom DeLong, he's a rock and roll guy. He's a, he's a guitarist and, a, and the lead singer. Well, you know what, folks? Before I did anything in the UFO field 41 years ago, I was I was in New York City trying to make a career being a folk singer. Right. Oh, really? Yeah. You know, you know, and and that's why I came to New York to mm-hmm. to make to, to make a record album. Um, and the irony and you did. of that, uh, you have and I ended up. That's exactly right. <laughs> <laughs> you know, uh, um, you know, um, I I don't have a college degree, I right. and and I'm I'm just very well read on it, and I just did different things to take the right steps to get to where I wanted to be. And I took chances, and you have to take chances. Uh, you, you have to do whatever you can and always try to maintain some kind of integrity or credibility along the way. Because if you, sounds, if, you, if you make – yes, I that sounds like – That sounds like the makings of a folk song. I don't got a college degree. I came to New York to make a record. And UFOs took over my life. I think hey, maybe I'll let, let, leave the singing to him, perhaps. <laughs> I think you're right. I, I have said many times, I've been very open in this attitude, and that is, I think I've paid some dues, and I think that the visitors, some of the visitors, one visitor should grant me an interview. That's all I ask. <laughs> that would be nice. <laughs> well, you did interview the the scaven- that Scandinavian rock singer girl. She is pretty strange, right? <laughs> oh, Elephant? <laughs> yeah. Elephant. <laughs> yeah. Which we, I guess we should move to the next story. And, and Lee, it's your yeah. turn. This feels like a game. You know, over the holidays, you play games with your family. And yeah. we were playing lots of different games. That's how this feels. Uh, Lee, you're next. It's your turn. Well, and, and the rest of my stories are in no particular order. I, I think that w- one of the more interesting ones ha- happened at the beginning of, of the year in January. <clears throat> the CIA treated us to some eye-opening information on its website. Yeah. You know, mm-hmm. first they, they, they published an article titled, Take a Peek into Our X-Files, mm-hmm. which detailed the agency's investigation of UFOs from the 1940s and 50s. And then they also posted what they called its 10 tips when investigating a flying saucer. Mm-hmm. Th- these were actual instructions for anyone with a hankering to establish a group to investigate and try and evaluate sightings. I thought that was fascinating that they did that. It, sure, it was timed a little bit uh, just about the time when the, the new X-Files episodes were coming out. Right. Uh, fine. But still, the fact that the CIA did this, and they didn't have to do this, um, and I enjoyed going through their material. I thought it was really interesting stuff that they released. And so I found it to be a pretty important thing that they would do. Mm-hmm. Right. Uh, I agree. That was my second uh, choice too, Lee. Mm. And, uh, oh, wow. And that, uh, that uh, I believe the files were, had already been out there. Is that, is that right? Yes. That's yeah. true. Because mm-hmm. I right. felt that this story, this made it to my list too. Um, uh, so it's funny. It, it made it to all of our lists. It, but it was a little bittersweet in that it was really cool and odd that the CIA would make their UFO files public and, and advertise them and good ones, you know, yeah. like the Lana yeah. Zamora case and stuff, right. some right. really mind boggling yeah. unsolved cases. But on the other hand, it was also frustrating 
because the vast majority of media reported it completely wrong, completely inaccurate, saying the CIA released brand new files. No, they right. didn't. These files have been out since the 70s. You know, Bruce McAbee will be the first to tell you because he's the one who helped get a lot of these files out in the first place. And they're in his books. So um, it was cool that they highlighted these, though. And thanks, thanks to the X-Files. That's right. Yeah, that's what probably spawned it. Martin, do you want to, what's your next one? Well, um, we are coming up on the 70th anniversary of Roswell, as you all know. Uh, and, uh, you know, Roswell was actually um, talked about, and there was a lot of things that happened with Roswell uh, last year. Of course, uh, you know, this coming year is probably going to be even more. But uh, first of all, it started out with um, – um, on on Kevin Randall's blog, the Ramey memo, there was an offer of a ten thousand dollar reward. Uh, this mm-hmm. was back in June for anyone um, that would be able to decipher the Ramey memo. Now, I know uh, is it uh, David Rudiak? I believe that's who it is. Has been working right. on it for a long time. Um, they do have criteria, but if someone can decipher that and. Uh, to me, it, it seemed more appropriate if it was like a million dollar <laughs> reward. <laughs> you know, it's just uh, it just seems like that would be totally the smoking gun if uh, if that really did have some great information. And then um, also last year there was a uh, interview um, with a UFO researcher with a woman that claimed to obtain material from the famous uh, crash uh, in Roswell and. Uh, um, so that was, uh, I believe her, she called herself Jill, I believed in the story. Mm-hmm. And, uh, so that was an interesting thing that happened. And, uh, and then the last thing was just recently, uh, a gentleman teamed up with the Roswell Daily Record to ask people to look, uh, look around to see if there's any, you know, we're coming up on 70 years. He thinks there's going right. to be, um, there's going to be a lot of publicity about the 70 year anniversary. So he basically wants people to take a look around to see if there's any type of trinkets, any, uh, I'm sure, documents or anything that may be stuffed away um, with a relative that may have been around uh, during that time. And also, uh, one thing that I say about that whole thing is, uh, you know, people sent letters, uh, you know, like the Civil War, for instance, there's tons of letters that went out about certain battles and things like that. so I would think that there would be some letters across the country where people would say, mm-hmm. hey, you can't believe what happened here. and uh, Or was it swept under the rug too quickly saying that it was a weather balloon and people just disregarded the whole thing? I don't really know. Uh, what, are your, what is your opinion, either one of you? Yeah, I think that's interesting. Um, of course, Lee and I are very excited because we're going to be speaking in Roswell again for the Daily Record. Right. But um, – Out of all of those, I guess just quick comments on each. First, the lady, Jill, who says when she was a little kid, she handled the material. Very interesting story. Uh, She comes across as very credible. Uh, The credit goes to Skyships over cashiers. They're the ones who created the video, and I thought she did a great job with it. So I reposted it, and I asked her some questions and did a little interview when I reposted it. Um it's hard to say. I mean, it, it baffles the mind. You kind of think, yeah, right. But uh, this lady just sounds very credible. And from um, the the lady who posted it, uh, who's a UFO researcher, she's she's also a very nice lady. Uh, this person sounds credible. So who knows? And it, it does get frustrating because there were a lot of people to just kind of call this BS. And I feel... And, you know, I'll say it really and because I think it's fair. There, there is a problem with um, sexism in this field. And I think it, it's kind of, you know, even if you look at uh, the media, they typically want male hosts because they say that uh, in the polls, women uh, don't seem as credible. And it's really unfortunate because I think a lot of people jumped on this story and were quick to say, oh, that's not real. Uh, even though we've posted, you know, even more incredible things from male uh, witnesses and, and people don't seem to jump on it as much. So it seemed kind of sexist, some of the reaction there. Wow. But otherwise, the, the $10,000 reward, David Rudiak has done a great job. You know, there's this memo 
that uh, General Ramey is holding in one of the famous pictures of Roswell in the past. And it seems like if you zoom in, you can read it. And David Rudiak has tried and he showed that it does seem like you can at least see the word disc and maybe even crashed and Fort Worth. So what you can see is very intriguing and uh, and it does seem like there's something there. So, yeah, some pretty exciting stuff. And it shows that this old case, lots of people are like, oh, where are we talking about this old case? Because there is some new stuff, you know, and there yeah. there is it's an interesting case. And like you said, you know, you're the perfect person to call this stuff out because you, you're in antiques, Martin. And I think that's a great observation. What about letters? Mm-hmm. You know, there could be letters. That could be a big deal. Right. <clears throat> And we've heard so many stories. Mm -hmm. Well, yes, and stories that we've all been aware of that so many people who were alive in 47 and so many what they call deathbed confessions, Mm -hmm. um, you you know, because they, they, they wanted to at least tell someone before they passed on about what they knew happened. And, you know, then, then the argument is, well, if they knew they were dying, uh, were they telling the truth, or do, do you think they just deliberately lied about something just to fake people out when they were gone? It's hard, yeah. it's hard to it's hard to know, um, but it's all it's all very intriguing. I think. Yeah. Well, yeah. Um, that was Mark. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. No, uh, I'll just leave the the thing I've heard that uh, deathbed confessions are, are actually hold mm-hmm. up pretty well mm-hmm. for the most part. Uh, because other yeah. people don't ha- – that's not usually an objective to fake anyone out. It's usually like just getting something off of their chest. Hmm. Yeah. So, uh, uh, yeah. so uh, I guess it's my turn, right? Oh, yeah. Yes. Okay. Let's see here. Uh, you know, I actually did have Milner, the old guy that you talked about uh, on my list. Um, but I think I'm going to do one of the best UFO sightings of the year, I feel – and this was the one that was captured in Wales by the St. Athens police helicopter. And it, it reminiscent of the Puerto Rico video, the FLIR video that we got to post, um, you know, uh, the, where the Homeland Security using their infrared camera, you know, caught this this object that they couldn't understand. This was a few years ago. Well, this happened just last year in Wales, where this police helicopter using their infrared tracked this object that they also could not explain. They don't, they don't know what the heck it is. Now, they tweeted only a few seconds of video of it. Um, They said the whole video was seven minutes, but that they had turned it over to the police. So they only had a few seconds of it. And even what they uh, released, it looks like, you know, they video record a screen with their cell phone and then they tweeted it. And they were like, you know, saying, what is this UFO question mark? And they put a little alien head thing on there. But they were genuinely baffled by this thing. Now, I had a, a FLIR expert. I had been working with uh, on the Puerto Rico thing. And so I brought this to him. Now, this is a depot level guy. When I say expert, he's an expert at these machines. Uh, Depot level means uh, he could take apart a FLIR to all of its tiny pieces and then put it back together. Mm. So he is like an expert at the actual mechanics and building the thing. In the process of testing and everything, they also see a lot of video. And like he says, there's probably nobody that sees as much video as they do. So they look at a lot. He's not a video expert. So that's not his expertise. But uh, they're usually able to identify things pretty quickly. And he says he doesn't know what that thing is either. He agrees with the police that this is a pretty strange video. I think that is the best sighting of the year, actually. Mm, a really interesting mm. one. Wow. Nice. You guys I, I remember this one? No, I, I don't think I saw that. And so I, I'm, I'm going to have to check that out and see again. Uh, yeah, um, and it was yeah. remarkable that these police would tweet about it, <laughs> you know, saying, what the heck is this? Right. Yeah. Alejandro, I don't remember us talking about this when this, ha- when this uh, was posted. Um, oh, really? I think maybe we did or or... I don't know. I, I would assume we did, but it was in September. Mm-hmm. Um, September 28th is when it was posted. The September 23rd is when the St. Athens uh, uh, police uh, 
air traffic uh, police uh, had tweeted about it. It's funny. I spoke to someone in Wales and asked them about UFO sightings. They said they're very rare. And I said, why? And they said, because they get really bad weather for the most part. Yeah. Well, you know, Arizona uh, has a lot of sightings, and I think that's because we have good weather. We have sunny skies most of the time. So I agree. I think that makes sense. Hmm. So let's do another round. I I think we're we're kind of long on time, but is that cool with you guys? We do at least one more round? Uh, Oh, yeah, because yeah, yeah, this this, this is one I'd like to kind of throw off my chest. It was one of my favorites of the year. Okay, go for Uh, it. it. It didn't get a lot of play in Western media. Uh, for some reason, and it, to me, it was like it was one of the more out of the left field items about UFOs and aliens. It happened in in October during a press conference in Iraq. The Iraqi transport minister, his name was Kazem Finjan. He was in the middle of of announcing the construction of a new airport in this particular district of Iraq, and all of a sudden. And he was surrounded by uh, men f- on his staff who were like to either side of him and behind him. He had a lot of microphones he was talking into, th- delivering this information about this new airport. He suddenly said, he, he made a proclamation that aliens had built the first airport on Earth 5,000 years ago oh, yeah. on the same site. <laughs> mm-hmm. and, and he went on to say that when, when the Sumerians, one of the earlier cultures – on the planet, when the Sumerians settled here in Iraq, that they knew full well that the atmosphere was suitable for flying to outer space. And it was from here uh, in Iraq, he said, that the Sumerian spaceships took off toward the other planets. <laughs> <laughs> wow. I, I know. And, 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 and you, know, you know what I had to do? Uh, because... They, there were videos went around showing him talking, and someone had put uh, like an English translation, uh, so that you know you would know what he was saying when he was probably talking one of the languages of Iraq. So I got in touch with two people at Huffington Post who speak fluent, uh, I think it's is it Farsi or Iraqi, um, and I said to them, look at this video, listen to what the guy is saying, and. Is the translation on the screen correct? And they both got back to me and said, "Yeah, this is what he's saying. Nobody, wow. nobody's faking this." And 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 yet, since then, there's been no follow-up information to clarify anything that he said. So I was thinking, well, okay, why why would this Iraqi government official even bring this up at a news conference? Was he was he following the directions of the Iraq government? I mean, it it, it was just plain weird. Is the man still alive? <laughs> I mean, I shouldn't laugh, but but like, holy cow! When when I saw this story, I said, "Yes, I've got to write this because just the fact that here is, is a government official very seriously saying, yeah, the Sumerians worked with the extraterrestrials and they built the first amazing airport here on Earth.' Like, okay, I'll write that. <laughs> that's, <laughs> that's funny. That's I remember one. when this story came across, and I thought, oh, this is just another one of the dumb UK tabloid stories. So I didn't give it much credence. And then you told me that you had gotten it translated, or you had yeah. verified that that's what yeah. he really said, because I was skeptical. And so I thought it was interesting. And then I don't remember if you had told me, or I forgot. You probably did tell me uh, everything he had said. Which is so weird and bizarre, but I kind of thought, well, and then I, it just passed. Just such a a weird thing for some, I guess, maybe a weird guy to say, but it does beg, you know, the question: How many people believe this? Is is he one of? Is this just his own pet theory, or uh, is that what the people in the well, region believe? Uh, it is weird. I well, and, and, to, and, and to me, Do you believe this, <laughs> this story was very similar to a story, Alejandro, that was one of one of yours and mine favorite from a year or two ago about that lovely man. I, I can never pronounce his name from Russia. Kirsan Ilyumzanov. <laughs> listen to you. Listen to of you. Kalmykia. Oh, what, that was the that was the same kind of wonderful story. He was like he's he's the yeah. head of the, what, the, the International Chess Foundation. Oh, yes. And, yeah. We, 
he's you know, he's friends with Vladimir Putin, and and he and he claims that he was floated out of his apartment into a spaceship and taken for a ride. I mean, you gotta love that. Yeah, <laughs> you're right. It reminds me of that. Just this quirky, weird story from an an a credible official. Just strange. <laughs> right. Funny. That's yeah. a good one. I'm glad you brought that up. Right. Yeah. Martin, what you got? Well, um, um, I was going to go with the CIA. That's gone. Uh, but I, uh, one thing that I would like to talk about, and you just mentioned it just a second ago, Alejandro, and we've talked about it a lot over this last year, was the, uh, uh, the extraordinarily uh, poor reporting that the U.K. tabloids have uh, been yeah. doing. And recently um, we're hearing a lot mm-hmm. in the news about the possible future of fake news. And I think um, mm. I think this is really affecting and could affect the UFO community and reporting and keeping, uh, you know, uh, this could muddy the waters quite a bit. And I think it's, it's, con- it's something to be concerned about. And- yeah, I agree. And I mean, I just, and it, it, as it proliferates, it gets more popular, and that's what people expect to read. And more sites, News Timeliner, I think, is a new one that's popped up that has this fake news stuff on it. But uh, even if we get less views, uh, I refuse to do that sort of thing. I mean, it, it's I attempt not to sensationalize. I, I know we all do. And it, it's just so frustrating and awful. But, you know, uh, kind of at least to give a kudos to Canadian news. It was kind of neat that Canadian news uh, did a lot of interviews with Chris Rutkowski, who's a great uh, researcher out there. When they released a report earlier this year about uh, Canadian UFO sightings and all the Canadian news went pretty crazy with it. And they all uh, posted it and they all interviewed Chris. And uh, luckily they did because uh, those were some really well done stories. That's an example of how to do it right in mm-hmm. this this flood of how to do it wrong that we're especially getting from these dang tabloids. I've seen Fox News picking up stories from The Sun, one of the worst UK tabloids, yeah. and they've picked up at least a couple of these awful UFO stories. Yeah, uh, yeah, and, and my experience of, of having some of my stories ripped off by the mm-hmm. British tabloids. And, and and they don't seem to care. It's it's like they have a cloak, uh, like like a protection cloak around them that they they're they're invulnerable to any kind of lawsuits. Um, yeah. They they just don't care that their writers are ripping people off. It, it it's mm-hmm. like they don't give credit where credit is due, and that that's that that's like a no no to to me. And uh, there have been many times when the Huffington Post, like legal team, has tried to get a lot of these people to stop and cease and desist and take take that story down because it's not it's not your story it's it's one of ours, and and they wouldn't. And nothing <laughs> happens because they're yeah it's yeah it, hmm. mm-hmm. yeah they, they it's, take it's, our stories a lot they take the Roger Marsh stories. Uh, that he posts, and then they put their own goofy spin. They usually talk to, unfortunately, Scott Waring, or you know, this guy who does this site who has, always mm-hmm. has these really odd perspectives and spins yeah. on the stories about the aliens, and they take that and post that and make it more sensational. And again, yeah, like you said, they don't, they never credit us. Well, Once yeah, in a while they know, do, but it's yeah. rare. And 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 Scott's. One of the main things he likes to do on his site, uh, he likes to promote the idea that at, at least once a week, once a week, one of the Mars rovers, or maybe the Curiosity, uh, is is coming back. It's transmitting back pictures of of some artificial constructions or something on Mars. It, mm-hmm. It's like this. It's a never ending list of of stuff coming back to us on Mars. Yeah. Now the only thing that I think that we can do is just um, keep our side of the street clean and and, yeah. and what we're doing. Um, mm-hmm. But uh, you know, this is just something that can't be fought. I don't think. Yeah, you're right. It's difficult, and and yeah. we saw it in the last election. It's difficult, uh, and and I and that it scares the hell out of me to be honest. Um, and, you know, one of the stories, my last story is going to be uh, about one of the stories or maybe even a suite of stories, really, that the media often 
does not pay attention to that I think is really important when it comes to UFOs. And it mostly has to do with the work of John Greenwald. Um, Mm. I just think he does some incredible work. And Mm -hmm. earlier this year, uh, very early in 2016, he wrote a story about the DIA. And this is a big deal. All of them, you know, uh, allegedly losing their UFO files. So this has happened to him before. So we got 250 files from the DIA, uh, Defense Intelligence Agency, in 1996 when he did a FOIA request about UFOs. However, most of these are blacked out, um, which is called redacted. So information that is still uh, not – which is top secret and can't be shared with the public is blacked out. And there's demonstration where some of these pages are are, – you can – There's a sentence or two and everything else is blacked out. Well, what you can do is ask for a lot of that information to be unredacted. So uh, you can go and say, look, it's been years. Some of this stuff that was secret, I'm sure is not anymore. Could you unredact these files so we can see more information? This is exactly what happened with the CIA document that about Area 51. That happened just a couple of years ago, and they did that. So now we can see the the Area 51 part, and, and that's how they essentially fessed up to Area 51 a couple of years ago. That made a lot of news. Mm-hmm. Well, the DIA told him, oh, we're sorry. We've lost those original files. We can't find them. So now all they have are copies of these blacked out ones, which is so frustrating. This happened to him uh, in 2015 with the NSA. So the NSA had something like a thousand files. This was a big deal. They had been sued by Cause Citizens Against UFO uh, Secrecy, um, and it was a big lawsuit because they didn't want to release their files, even their uh, memo to the judge as to why they had to keep these files secret are all blacked out. Um, Stanton Friedman shows these a lot. Well, John Greenwald did the same thing. Okay, it's been years. You should be able to unredact some of those information. Uh, And they said, oops, we've lost those files. We can't find the originals. All we have are the blacked out ones. And and one of the later things that happened to him, uh, which I think is kind of shocking, is the FAA. The FAA recently told him uh, we don't have any UFO files, which absolutely seems ridiculous because there was a big story in uh, Chicago in 2008 where over Chicago Hair United Airlines uh, personnel pilots yeah. saw an object over one of the uh, concourses and one of the gates. And this was a disc. Oh, you even have the date. Yeah, May 17th. No, the no, disc shot up. C-17, I'm sorry. Oh, C-17, the gate. Yeah, yeah, I have a picture of the gate. Last time I went through there, <laughs> I took a picture. Um, but, uh, yeah, the object punched through the clouds. Uh, the FAA, the Chicago Tribune investigated it. The FAA said, oh, no, we don't know anything about that. Uh, they did a FOIA, and luckily they have a lot more uh, might than, than many of us. And, and uh, the FAA had to fess up, oh, yeah, I guess we did get reports on that. So there's an example. We know they have files. But they're lying. All of these organizations uh, have been caught in lies. We've written about NORAD getting caught in lies. They lie about UFOs. If there's nothing to hide, why are they lying? And uh, I'll, I'll, t- I'll tell you why they're lying. Because they know that they can get away with it. Yeah. And you've had See, firsthand think, yeah. experience, Lee. Yes. Uh, yeah. I think it's it's that simple. These are These are people sitting behind their desks in Washington or wherever they get these these four year requests um, and and basically they can say oh look at what they're asking us for they want this this and then that um, we're just gonna we're just gonna wait them out let's wait oh let's see we'll come back to this let's say in three weeks and we'll send them uh, back a letter saying we couldn't find the files you know and then let's see if that will get them off course um, and we won't hear from them again or maybe they'll Try another FOIA request, and so we'll we'll wait for them to to send us another request. We'll wait another couple of weeks to respond, and we'll tell them we've lost the files, and we'll keep wearing them down until we don't hear from them again. Mm-hmm. I think that I think they do that very effectively. I think yeah. you're probably right because you really think about it. Um, how can you actually lose files unless it was misfiled? I understand there there are massive massive archives. 
uh, unless something was refiled and misrefiled um, yeah. or destroyed. I mean, where else would it go? I mean, you, mm-hmm. you, you don't just lose them, I don't think. Yeah, it happened to Leslie Kane with uh, the Kecksburg UFO files with NASA. Oh, yeah. And uh, she, they sued. Uh, NASA had to actually – NASA took Leslie Kane to their files and said, look, you can look through. We'll show you how this works and everything. And she looked and they, she said, yeah, they lost them. She's like, you know, I don't, I don't know why or how or what or who, but uh, I confirm they did – they don't have them. Very frustrating. So that's that's everything. Uh, do you guys have anything you're dying to get out there? Like you had to get a <laughs> shout out on this one and, and you're just dying inside because you didn't get it out. Not really. I know, uh, you know, NASA, there was a lot of talk about NASA having uh, cut feeds and stuff like that. You know, I saw a lot of that over the last year. Um, I don't know how accurate any of that stuff is, so I, I didn't really want to talk about it. But, um, you know, what are your thoughts on, on all those reports? Well, you know, for, for, for several years, I, I like to refer to them as UFO aficionados. And they, these are the people who have a, a huge amount of time on their hands who enjoy watching live video transmissions from the International Space Station. And they they very often have accused NASA of deliberately cutting its video feed right at the same moment when when an alleged UFO enters the field of view. <laughs> and what, what, one of those moments, this was on my list, uh, took place in July. The, the slow-moving bright object appeared near the space station, and the video feed was going. And it was descending from space, supposedly heading toward Earth. And... Uh, and then all of a sudden the, the the feed was cut off. You know, temporary temporarily we can't uh, get our feedback and try again later. NASA NASA generally shrugs off these conspiracy claims as nothing more than they just say, oh, that was just a space station window reflection or earthbound lights, which commonly appear as photo artifacts from, from the orbiting laboratory. And our friend Mark D'Antonio loves t- talking about photo artifacts. <laughs> uh, but, but again, it's the same thing. NASA doesn't have to admit anything if it can just shrug it off. Y- you know, um, and it, it's really impossible to tell. I mean, there was a big story in, in, in last year's, Year end that we talked about. I forget the name of the the astronaut. It was Scott. Um, I forget his last name, but he the he had taken a picture. Space so long for extended uh, yes, amount of time. Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah. And he had taken this picture of of India at night, and um, it was a beautiful picture because it was all lit up on the ground, and people started wondering well, what what is this horizontal uh-huh. um, like tube tube like thing in the sky. Uh, near the top of the picture, and it went viral. Oh, UFO, UFO! And people couldn't figure out what it was. I took the the uh, the original picture that he had t- posted on on uh, Facebook, or that he had uh, tweeted about, and I I just made a copy of it, put it into my Photoshop, and I I increased the contrast and the brightness, and all of a sudden this vertical or horizontal UFO suddenly it was obvious it was part of the space station mm-hmm. you could see that we you could see exactly where it was attached and and all the equipment around it but because the original picture that scott had taken um uh, showed a dark sky this thing looked like it was just hovering there in space and all you all you had to do is adjust the contrast and whoop, another one down the you know down the tubes no UFO. that's how i feel these days and you know we you mentioned mark d'antonio and uh the yeah. mufon photo analyst and stuff and he's uh got a degree in astronomy and everything and he's yeah. he's very quick to burst our bubble on these yeah. cases and i just have not seen any of these alleged cutoffs this year as frustrating as it may be to some people i just personally have not found any of them to be actual cutoffs because they felt they were observing something uh, unusual. Uh, right. I, I have not seen one yet that has convinced me of that. Um, yeah. 
that's kind of how I feel so far on that. I mean, I'm I wish I was wrong, and I always hope that one day I will be wrong that that they will f- get something on video. Uh, but uh, I just haven't seen it yet personally. Mm. Yep, I agree. I agree. And the, and the only other story that that for some reason was was a big successful story for me last year, and it kind of started off with um, the, the the Science Channel series called NASA's Unexplained Files. They presented an episode which Mark is on. Um, that's right. That, that's exactly right. Yes, uh, strange music was recorded mm-hmm. by the Apollo the Apollo ten astronauts in 1969 while their spacecraft. Was was flying over the far side of the moon, so that's right. at a point when when all, anybody in, in in an orbit at that point, their communication is cut off from Earth because they're on the other side of the moon. Um, but it was described by one of the astronauts as sounding like outer space type music, and it began a little bit of controversy that lasted a few years. Um, later on, it turned out that it was it was decided that it wasn't alien but some kind of radio interference. Uh, but still, you know. Um, could it have been something truly unexplained? There are sounds of outer space out there. Planets give off their own sounds, and I, I find that to be pretty fascinating stuff. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And we do have uh, outstanding questions. Martin, you mentioned that yeah. 243 planets are getting the weird light signals from. Uh, mm-hmm. That's still an outstanding. We've got that the mega structure planet. Right. Um, issue that you know mark likes to talk about d'antonio when we have him on so yeah there are still outstanding mysteries (sighs) (laughs) all right well i guess that is it gentlemen well this was fun a lot of fun once again yes thank you so much for for joining us and i think this will be a long one but people love longer shows so uh, <laughs> a lot of cool stuff and uh, it's fun because overall i kind of felt like 2016 was a little boring but uh, as we just talked about there was still even in a quote-unquote boring year to me uh there's still a lot of exciting cool stuff that went on yeah exactly i, I think the extraterrestrials were paying attention to our election yeah, they were busy watching was. TV, just yeah. cracking up, uh, pointing at the screen and laughing and falling over in their chairs. <laughs> They're just wondering what that thing is that's living on top of President-elect Trump's head. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they might know. <laughs> <laughs> might be something of theirs. All right, guys, thanks so much, and uh, we'll, we'll hopefully talk to you soon. Okay, Very take good. it easy. Thank you so much to Lee Spiegel and Martin for joining us for the 2016 year in review. The year's finally done and we're into 2017. And you know what? This is kind of cool. This is a good sign for 2017. I haven't had a problem um, typing out and writing 2017. Usually it takes me a month or two to switch over. So it's not until maybe February that I'm getting the year correct uh, when I'm writing stuff. But you may have noticed if you look at our daily UFO headlines, I haven't messed up once, and that's kind of rare. So I'm, I'm proud of myself, and hopefully that's a good sign for the year. Although I don't think there were a lot of great, fantastic UFO sightings. But besides that, you know, police helicopter one from Wales, uh, there were a lot of sightings. Um, so that's interesting. And... Uh, There's still a lot of interesting news related to UFOs. So, you know, we were not at a loss of of getting out information or um, getting, you know, some more analysis out for you all. In fact, I'm really proud of some of the stuff we've done, including the two Open Minds magazines, Volume 1 and 2, that we did, the video versions, which I think are really important. Of course, those are on hold right now because we are 100% focused on the UFO Congress. That's only about a month away, a little more than a month away. And we're really excited about it. I mean, ticket sales are great, uh, which is wonderful. So go get your tickets. Uh, You need to get your tickets by the end of the month in order to get the discounted price. And they are much cheaper as far as hotel rooms. You know, the host hotel sells out very early. They do have a wait list, but I would imagine it's pretty sizable by now. 
And uh, so those rooms sold out in October, actually. However, no big deal because there are lots of hotels around that are really nice. And at least a few of them do free shuttle rides to the uh, conference location. And uh, it's not very far. It's just a few minutes away uh, from those locations. What's cool about this place, if you haven't been there, is that it's in the desert. And it's absolutely beautiful. I mean, it is so gorgeous out there. Um, if you haven't seen pretty desert, maybe like me, you're from Colorado and you're like beautiful desert. There's nothing but, but dirt out in the desert. There actually can be pretty desert, uh, the big cacti and the, uh, saguaro or saguaro and, uh, the bushes and the trees are very colorful and the lizards, man, lizards are cool. I love lizards. And if you haven't seen javelinos, these are really cool. These are like little piglet pig kind of things. Uh, that we have in the desert out here. I wasn't even aware of that until I moved out here, but they're cool little guys. Um, And lots of quail. It's fun to see the quail running around, and you get to see a roadrunner on occasion, let alone the beautiful sunsets and the warm weather. Some of you right now are frigid, and you're probably huddled around a fire uh, with a few coals uh, listening to this show. But, uh, uh, well, just kidding. But I do know that you're probably dreading your ride home because there's icy roads and uh, snow possibly uh, in many places. But not out here. In fact, we've got sunshine. We had a a rainy week, which was kind of weird and a bummer for me because I love the sun. But that was about it. Now we're back to the sunshine. And it's always a great escape to come out to the deserts of Arizona. And like I said, we've got a cool lineup. We're going to have uh, special Phoenix Lights uh, things, and then we're going to have just a lot of cool speakers. So go to ufocongress.com to look at that list of speakers and to see the schedule of what's going down. So hopefully we'll see you there. It's going to be another great year, and I'm super, super excited about it otherwise you know uh we've got another show scheduled this one was a little late because of the holidays but we should be back on track at least for next week it does get dicey this time of year because of the conference you know it's a lot of work and uh we've got to get a lot of things done so sometimes that causes us not to be able to do a show but i already have a great show Um, almost put together for Monday, so we will have one out then, and I think you all are going to enjoy it very much. So, uh, like this show, I love this show, wasn't this a cool show? Uh, The next one's really cool too. So thank you all for being here, thank you to 